Welcome to Jesus and Me with Pastor Tom Harmon, who is the lead pastor of Kingsville Community Church. Here you will find relevant Bible teachings and practical training about being a follower of Jesus Christ. And now, Pastor Tom. We're talking about worship today. And we have been talking about worship the uh, last week. We started this whole new series, Come to Worship, as we look at the Christmas uh, story. And specifically, we look at the Magi. And we want to talk about all the different things that have to do with worship. Because worship is not music. Music is used in worship, but worship is not music. Um, Worship is a lot of things. Worship is working in the community center. Worship is doing host team. Worship is doing children's ministry. Worship is helping and giving somebody a, a cup of coffee. Uh, in, in fact, I, I asked Ron and the worship team if they would open with that verse from Romans chapter 12, which says that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, which is our spiritual Worship, And so worship is, is really uh, an attitude and a place where our heart is that really encompasses everything, everything that, that we do. And so we're looking at what does it mean to worship and these elements of, of worship. And so uh, Christmas Eve, two weeks from now, we'll be ending this series and we'll be talking about worship in our morning service, and then our evening service on Christmas Eve is a candlelight service at 7 o'clock. And I encourage you to invite family and friends out to those two really special services on Christmas Eve. But as we look at worship today, we want to go to Matthew chapter 2, and we want to talk about a very important aspect in our worship, and that is generosity, generosity, or giving how we give. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to do, one and 2, it says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judah, Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, why were they coming? Why were they seeking out Jesus? They wanted something to do something specific. They wanted to worship. They wanted to worship him. That was their whole intention. So what we see them doing is worship. Now they stop and they talk to King Herod. And King Herod was evil. He was not a nice person. He was an evil king. And he was afraid that his kingdom was going to be threatened and Herod said, well, I want to go and worship him too, so when you find him, let me know where he is so I can worship him too. (laughs) But we know that an angel came to him and said, don't believe that guy, he's evil. Go back home on another route. Don't go back through Jerusalem. In verse 9, it says, after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And so they followed this star. Now, these guys came from the east, but they weren't Chinese, all right? They didn't bring fortune cookies or any of that kind of stuff to Jesus. They were bringing different things. They were not that far from the east, but they were in present-day Iraq or Iran. That's where these guys came from, and they have been following that star for approximately, scholars think, about approximately 900 miles they walked. Now, I thought, uh, I, what would that be like today if we decided, let's all go for a walk and follow a star for 900 miles? And so, uh, from Kingsville, <laughs> we could go in two directions, three actually, if we were really uh, you know, wanting to walk a lot. Uh, but 900 miles would take us to Fort Franks. Has anybody ever been to Fort Franks? Oh, is it a nice place? It's what? It's cold. And it's got mosquitoes. Okay, so we would walk around. You could go around uh, Lake Michigan 
Um, you could stop in Chicago. There, that's exciting. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to walk through Chicago. No? I'd like to drive through and keep the doors locked. Okay. Uh, they had to walk and they had donkeys, so I'd have to walk through Chicago and basically all the way up and we, all around Lake Superior. I mean, really. This was a long walk to put it into um, perspective. And we've heard that uh, it's cold, and we've also heard that there's mosquitoes. Uh, two of our favorite things, right? We have to walk through dense forest and cold and mosquitoes, and they would have had to walk through. They didn't have dense forest. They had nothing, no water. It was they, what they called wilderness was desert. So they had to go through desert places. And uh, we'd have to go through places that are dangerous, where you want to keep the doors locked. Well, oftentimes, they would be in on those roads that they used. There were thieves on those roads as well back then. Not much has changed. And they were carrying gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, and so they went on this very long and painful journey without WestJet or Air Canada to help them or the convenience of modern roads or transportation. And so in verse 10, it says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. I can imagine they were. Finally, there it is, and it's still ahead of us, and it's still leading us. And so we see this, this it's kind of hard to explain what this word that they're used here in the Greek means. It's, it's kind of this, this joy that's humongous and gigantic and big. It's like, wow! It, it's like the Leafs winning the Scan Stanley Cup, or even better, okay, for a Leaf fan. Maybe nobody else cares, but a Leaf fan will just about have a heart attack when that happens. They will be so overjoyed, overjoyed. And, you know, that's the problem, I think, in a lot of Christians, a lot of churches today, is not that we're overjoyed, but we tend to be a lot underjoyed, don't we? We tend to, we tend to meet Christians that, and churches that are so underjoyed. And, and yet, we should be the most happy people, the most joyous people, the most overjoyed people in all of the world because we know the King of Kings. He came for us. He died for us. He has given us his presence, his spirit. He's forgiven every one of our sins. I mean, is there any reason why we should be grumpy? Is there any reason we should be sour pusses? You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, we, we should be so full of love. This just should be just kind of overflowing us and so full of grace. You know, I, 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 I used to be so doggone legalistic. I, I used to be so legalistic. And I, I found out when I was legalistic, I, I had to deal with people through my legalism. I had to find out what was wrong with them. And, you know, one of the things I, I was missing was joy. And then I, I, I got to the place where I, I, I looked at Christ and I thought, gee, Jesus died for my sins because I was such a creep. And now I'm treating people like I'm better than they are. And now, you know what I do? I, I, just, I, I just greet people with love and grace. And I, I let God work things out in their life because I, I, I'm just, you know what? I don't want to lose my joy. I really don't. I don't want to lose my joy. Oh, people, people, people sometimes lose their joy over so many simple things little things, what he said, what she said, what they're doing, what they thought, what I think that they thought that they said. Oh my goodness, all the things we allow to steal our joy. And we just got to let that stuff go. We could be more like these guys. You see, these guys worship God out of a heart of joy. And, and if you don't have that in your heart, you can't worship God at all. You really can't. You can't worship God in a heart of bitterness. <laughs> or you can't worship God out of a heart of anger. I think Satan likes to put all that stuff in there. But it, God wants to put in love, peace, and joy. You know, when you experience the Holy Spirit in your life, the Holy Spirit is not eating and drinking or anything, legalistic stuff, but it's love and peace and joy that the Holy Spirit brings in your heart. And so if you're missing that, then you're missing out on the most important thing, right? You're missing out on God. 
Verse 11. Let's continue. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So you get a picture of these guys are just overjoyed to come and to finally find the baby, the Messiah King. And so they serve him and they worship him with joy, presenting to, them, to him their gifts. And, you know, that's, I think, one of the reasons why we give gifts at, at Christmas. It has to do with this event right here because we see this is an acceptable act of our worship is coming with a cheerful heart and giving gifts now you, you know i was watching the tv the, the only gift a guy can give a girl around this time of the year is, is like diamonds right i mean you got to spend like the bigger the diamond the better okay you know because then you know that really means that that you uh love her um and, and I heard of something new, and I just must be out of, out of the loop on diamonds. Kind of thankful I am. I, I just, <laughs> like, uh, the chocolate diamonds, that, that caught my ear. I, did hey, anybody ever heard of chocolate diamonds? They're like brown diamonds, you know? And I thought, are, brown, are diamonds supposed to be brown? And so I, I looked up chocolate diamonds, and they, like, it's like they're, they're the most plentiful type of diamonds, and they, they use them in... in, in um, industry and they're like well how can we make more money on this and and let's call them chocolate and and, and the ladies will like them better so um there's you got chocolate diamonds but i'll tell you what really brings to joy our our heart is is not buying diamonds but buying stuff for the grandkid we my, my wife has been buying stuff and she brings it home and honestly there's so much c- cool stuff that even the dogs are jealous and they're whining like mm-hmm. Give me that, give me that, you know. And, and, and it's like little dancing toys and all this kind of stuff. Boy, I'll tell you, it's not, it's not what you give, but it's the attitude you give it in. Isn't that right? And that's what these guys had discovered. And, you know, they've been debating for centuries, too, of what these gifts really mean. What these gifts mean, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What they actually symbolize. And most... Most scholars and commentators say, you know, gold symbolizes Jesus' identity, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So right from the time he was born as a little baby, he was given this identity, and this identity is seen in the gifts, King of kings and Lord of lords. And then the frankincense uh, represent his ministry, his ministry, because frankincense was used in the temple in all of the sacrifices and in, um, in, in the worship part of the temple. And so Christ, as, as early as being a baby, came to do his priestly ministry. Now, priest, you know priest means, it doesn't mean fancy robe with a weird collar, okay? That's not what it means, priest. Priest means bridge. That's, that's what the, the word actually means. It means bridge. And Jesus came to be our high priest, or our, our bridge. Now, the Bible says that you and I are priests. And so we actually, we help people to make that bridge to God through Christ. But Christ is the main bridge. So we, we're kind of little bridges to the big bridge and helping people get across big bridge. And that's what Jesus is. He became the bridge to God and man. And so frankincense represented that role of his priestly ministry. And then myrrh, actually represents his mission. His mission. Myrrh was used in preparing uh, people's bodies for burial. That's a weird gift to give to a little baby, isn't it? And, and yet here it is. And so it represents his mission that Jesus came to save us, to die for our sins so that we could be forgiven. So as we look at these gifts... They had significance, but more important than that is the kind of worshiper who presented it, one who was cheerful, came from a worshiping, cheerful heart. And so for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm just asking the Holy Spirit to start doing a a work in you because if, if you don't like giving now, my prayer is that you would become so in love with giving, that you would become 
a hilarious giver, that, that you would look forward to ways to give. You plan to give. You'd have strategic giving. You'd be overjoyed to give because that's one of the values that we saw in our church when we asked ourselves, what do we really value? One of the things was generosity. And so everything we do, we, we want to give back. We want to give back to our town. We want to give back to people. That's why we do the things that we do. And so we made that a value, and we hung it out on a, on a uh, banner there, out on the upper for, foyer, that we value generosity. It's about who we need to be. And if we're generous people and have a heart of generosity, we become better worshipers. We become better worshipers. Love gives, doesn't it? Love gives. I mean, there's, there's no such thing as love if that love isn't expressed in giving. And the Bible tells us that this is, this is how God loved us. It says, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. God gives not because he has to. He's not sitting in heaven going, oh, look what they've done. They've really screwed things up. What am I going to do now? <laughs> no, he gives because he loves the world. I mean, when we look at the world, you look at your, your, your front page of your newspaper, or you read the news or hear the news, and you think, God loves that? No, God doesn't love the mess, but God loves us. And he sent Christ to fix the mess that we've created. God so loved the world that he gave. Not gold, frankincense, or myrrh, but he gave his son. Peter says that God did not give us uh, uh, gifts of gold, silver, or precious stones, but rather gave us the precious blood of his son to save us and to forgive us. That's how much God loves the world. Because love gives, God looks at creation and he realizes that we were separated from him because of our sins. And the only way that we could be right with him was if someone innocent would die in our place, someone without sin. And so that only person he could find was himself. So God became flesh in the person of Jesus, lived a perfect life, died, rose again, so that anybody who places their faith in him can have his gift that he gives to us, which is everlasting life, eternal life. Love gives. God is love, and that's what God does. God just gives. We serve a giving, living God. God loves and God gives because he loved us, not because we chose to love him. In fact, it says God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't shout his love from heaven. He showed his love for you on earth and sent Jesus to die for your sins. So love gives. God's love gives, and that's what we see on the first Christmas, is God's love giving. And we need to simply receive that love. We need to receive salvation, and it's very simple. It's just basically saying to God in our heart, Lord, I accept your gift. I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you. I receive you into my life. You say that in your own words. You know what? You've received God's gift of love. You've received his eternal life. You don't have to do any big thing for it. You just have to receive it by faith because God loves you. So God loves you, but God's love didn't end just there. God's love keeps on giving, amen? It keeps on giving. It just doesn't stop giving. God does not know. There's some things God doesn't know. One of the things God doesn't know, he doesn't know how to stop giving because that's his nature. It's in his nature to give. He doesn't know how to stop loving because it's in his nature to love. He doesn't know how to stop giving because it is in his nature to give. Now, a lot of people feel that God's love is only expressed in a general kind of way. Like I may say, 
I just love everybody here today. And you might look at me and go, oh, that's nice. That's positive. He has some positive feelings about us. He's, he's, <laughs> maybe, what, I shouldn't maybe? <laughs> if, I knew, if he knew me better, he wouldn't. Uh, he loves everybody here, and so he, he has some, he's a sentimental kind of guy. He's just a wonderful guy. And you, you probably just go out saying, well, you know, that's what a, what a nice pastor. What a nice man, you know. Um, and, and that would be the end of it. But if I say to you, I love Nita, then, then you would know that I love her on a different level than I love all of you together, right? I love her in an intimate way. I, I bought her a diamond. Uh, ring. I, I'm glad I bought her that ring thir- thir- 30 years ago because today it would cost what I'd need for a house. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh my goodness, it was cheaper to get married back then, wasn't it? Now all the fel- fellows who were like in their 50s said, amen, amen. We had a, a piano player in our church in, in London and, and um, when there was somebody she didn't like, she would say, um, I love them in a world vision kind of way. (laughs) That means I'm here and they're over there. And every now and then she'd get ticked off at me. I don't know how because I'm such a loving guy. But she'd say, Pastor, I want you to know I love you in a world vision kind of way. And that's how, unfortunately, that's how a lot of people think God loves them. In a world vision kind of way. That that God is kind of over there and, and, and they're over here. And, and it's just kind of like sentiment. You know what I'm saying? Sentiment. But that's not the vision that Jesus gives of the Father's love. And that's not why he came. He came so God would know that we love him, that he loves us in an intimate kind of way. In fact, God expresses and Jesus teaches that God's love for us is so close and intimate that it is the way a parent would love a child. Or, or better still, the way a grandparent would love a grandchild. I, you know, I mean, we, we're just spoiling that kid. It's just awful. But um, just because we're just so, so much in love and so just love, that, that's all it is. You just feel it, and you can't, there's no way of stopping it. That's how God loves you. In fact, Jesus says this. So if you sinful people, you people whose love is sometimes tainted with pride, whose love is sometimes not all that sincere, whose, whose love is sometimes not all that pure. If, if you simple, sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Well, I, that's where I have to stop and say, I can't even imagine how much more. It's beyond my ability to imagine. That's where God transcends. He goes way beyond my understanding. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? God loves you intimately. As a parent loves their child. Now, how much more love does God have for you than a parent for their own child? Far more. Far more. So how much more will God give good gifts to those who ask him? I can't think of anything on earth that is more stronger, that is stronger than a parent's love for their children. And yet God's love is much stronger than that for you. That's what Jesus points out for us, that God's love just keeps giving and giving and giving. And God interacts with us and gives us Good gifts. Now, you know what? I'd like to, uh, there's a, a few folks that have received, and just God has given them a great, just touched them and, and, and given them something good. We rejoice in God's love. I, I asked Brandon to come and share because we have been praying for Brandon's brother's brother in law. So I don't know how that relates to you, Brandon. He kind of shows up for Turkey, right? Every now and then, not at all? Actually, he also used to be one of my uh, youth at my uh, previous church. Oh, okay. And so I, I know him as well. Well, what happened was he, one night, um, he just stopped, uh, stopped breathing. And, and they, his, his parents found him unconscious in his room. Uh, and they had no idea how long he wasn't breathing. 
uh, rushed him to the hospital, and uh, it it didn't it didn't look didn't look good. Um, if he was asleep for a couple of weeks, and the doctors told them, there we don't know how long he wasn't breathing for, and there's there's a very strong chance that he's going to have brain damage, um, and he may not even wake up. We don't know, and so there there was it was it was a, a hard time for them, and. And uh, the, one, one test showed that there was brain damage in three areas of the brain. My sister-in-law was saying it, 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 was, it was tough. And, and uh, last, I think it was last weekend, uh, after he was, he was transferred uh, to a, a, a another hospital for some, from some more extensive care, uh, he woke up, and there's no brain damage. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was... It was He's, he's walking around, and he's, he's home. He's still a little weak because he was in bed for, for a few weeks, but uh, uh, the doctors are in complete shock and awe. Uh, unbelievable. They said there's no way that this should happen. He shouldn't be walking. He shouldn't be brain damage free. He, uh, this is a miracle, and, uh, even, and the family is just, just so excited and, uh, and, and shocked as well and uh, thankful for this, and uh, it's from the prayers, you know, we had him on the prayer chain, and from, uh, and then my family, and his family, and just prayers from all over the place, uh, God answered the prayers, and, uh, and he was, uh, he was given this, this gift this Christmas, so. Amen. See, see, this is God interacting with us, and it's when God does a healing like that, he's not just interacting with the person who's healed, but he's interacting with you because you're one of the ones who are praying. So if you want to interact with God, you pray. Now, I'm going to ask if Ruth Colleen would come. She's one of our board members. And uh, Ruth, if, if you could just kind of give a little history to what you've been through this year and how God has met you. Yes, we'll use this microphone right here. It is different up here. It's hotter, it's hotter up here, too, isn't it? Back in August, um, I had to go for uh, an x-ray because they thought maybe I, the doctor couldn't hear something in my lungs. So I went for the x-ray. And that night, and they said, well, you have to stay in the hospital tonight. That night, I found out I had lung cancer. Then, um, but the, Pat, he decided he was going to call my friend Mary, and he had to come and tell Pastor Tom what was going on. And, and right from the get-go, there was prayer. Right from the get-go. <clears throat> so from there, I ended up in the hospital, and I'm telling Pastor Tom, and I'm telling everybody else, well, whatever God wants, if he wants me to, if this is my time, I'm ready. I'm good. I'll, you know, it's okay. And uh, Pastor Tom boldly prayed for healing and I'm thinking to myself ah, I don't know like I've seen this before and people really don't last through this one um, and then I ended up on oxygen the highest oxygen you can have and uh, in and out of the hospital and and all of that and and everything moves so quickly the test the biopsy Everything just moves so quickly where normally you got to wait for this test and wait for that test, but that didn't happen to me. It was just click, 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 and I was there, and I had no choice. God just picked me up, and he said, no, you're going to, you're not going to give up. You're just going to carry on, and this has been since August. Went for a CAT scan just a, uh, a week or so ago, went to the cancer doctor, and she says, we can't find anything. There's nothing, there's no, um, there's no cancer in your lungs, there's no cancer in your lymph nodes. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, th that is, I am convinced it's, it's prayer. And, and I prayed too, but I didn't pray. When I was down, I knew somebody else was praying for me. When I, when I didn't have the faith, you people had the faith for me. So um, they're still uh, they're going to be doing some preventative radiation on my head because, like, 
can like it's the type of cancer that I was diagnosed with. I'm not saying that I have anymore. I'm saying that I was diagnosed with. And they are going to be doing some radiation on my head just as a preventative so it doesn't go to the head if it comes back. So this is a, a tes testimony to me and a testimony to, to everybody else, too, that Jesus is still in the healing business. And he heals through prayer. Um, and I just praise him. And I give him all the glory. And, there, and even in the times when I was down, I, I'm always telling people, like I would imagine myself crawling up on God's, God's um, knee. And, and there were times when he would just be stroking my face, face and just, just rest in me. And I will take care of it all. And he did. So far, it's, it's you know, it's, it's gone. i still a little hesitant saying that it's gone, but they don't see anything. So that's the way it is. So and I'd like to thank you all uh, as my brothers and sisters in Christ and the prayers that I had from out west and from Owen Sound. Uh, nobody can tell me prayer does not God does not listen to us. So he does. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Wow. You, you know what? It's, it's, it's God. And, and it's not for me to figure things out. It's just for me to believe and pray and leave things in God's hands and, and trust him. Because he is a God who gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. And, you know, we can just thank God for his generous gifts as a congregation. When you pray for somebody and ask God to heal them, you're a part of that. You're a part of that healing. And you're interacting with God in an intimate, wonderful, wonderful way. And our Father loves giving good gifts to his children. And he doesn't ask his children to figure it out because I can't. I can't figure it out. I just, I just take what God brings and gives me, and I thank him for it. And we thank him for it every day because love gives, amen? And God's love keeps on giving. And so you and I need to be givers. We need to be like these three guys. Now, some of you may say, you know what, I, I love God, and, but I have a hard time with the giving bit. And, and I'd love to give, but I, I, sometimes I feel pressured or I feel like I'm being manipulated or I'm afraid or I'm hesitant or I'm, I'm reluctant or what if the church isn't doing what the church should be doing with my money. Or all, there's all of these things that try to get in the way of us giving to God. But let, let me just share with you uh, a couple, uh, just basically uh, one area of Scripture, maybe two, and, and, and let's hear what God says. It says this, God calls us to trust him. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So in all of our lives, whether it's in our sickness, whether it's in health, whether it's in our giving, whether it's in our serving, whether it's in using our gifts, we're called to trust God. Trust him, trust him, trust him. And he says this, verse 7, going down, we're just working through this proverb. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. In other words, you can't understand it. You can't understand it. When God gives and when you're giving, you don't understand it. You can't. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Amen. Trust in the Lord and don't worry. Don't, don't try to understand it because you can't. But then it goes on and listen to verse 9. In this whole area where Solomon is talking about trusting in the Lord, not walking in your own understanding, just trusting him, he says this, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And honor means to adore him. That's what the wise men were doing, the, the magi. They were coming to worship him. We sing that around Christmas. Oh, come let us adore him. I, I won't sing too much because they, they tend to turn my mic off when I sing. I don't understand. <laughs> so we worship the Lord with our 
with our wealth, with, with the time he's giving us, our wealth of time, our wealth of talents. And believe me, in this place, we've got a wealth of talent. And with our wealth of treasure, our finances. So the Magi came to worship him. This is very important. They worshiped Jesus, and they came. They were overjoyed. They were joyful, and they opened up their treasures, and they worshiped him through their giving. And that's how they worshiped him. And that's how we can worship him as well. Now, about this overjoyed part, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, verse 9, I think I put it up on the, on the overhead, for God loves a cheerful giver. Somebody who gives cheerfully, just like the wise men. God will generously provide all you need, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Like the Magi, who were cheerful and filled with joy, there was a promise attached to, attached to your generosity. God will generously provide all you need. And then the, the last verse here that we're going to look at in Proverbs, from that chapter 3, it goes on. We've got verse uh, right down to verse 9. And then verse 10, Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, we don't want you drinking too much new wine this Christmas. If it's overflowing, sh share it. You didn't hear that. <laughs> what happens in church stays in church. Okay. <laughs> in other words, God is saying here is that you'll have more than you need. And why do you get more than you need? So you can be generous and you can share with others. When Nita and I got married, we made honoring God with our giving, our tithing. We made it a habit. And God has never let us down. He never has. When we were both, uh, we both quit our jobs in General Motors, we went to Bible college, we had no income. And there were times where we wouldn't tell people we didn't have no income. That's the thing. We, we, we just didn't broadcast it. We just didn't say anything. And, and there were times we would find money under the door. And, and we think, how did God know? Well, God knew. The person putting it under obviously heard from God. We don't know who did it. We still don't know. Yet God provides. And God will provide for you when you have a generous heart that worships God worships him. Now, I'm not saying if you give, you're going to get money stuffed under your door. What I am saying is that God is faithful. And you know what? God does challenge us. He challenges us in my Malachi. He says to us, he says this, test me in this. If you don't believe me, test me in this. Worship me in your generosity and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and bless you. And why does he do that? Because we give to him? Are you kidding me? He gives that because he is a loving God. He's a generous God, and he wants to bless you. I, I never ask really how much. I really don't. I, I try to get a sense of the direction God wants me to go, and I just do it. And people sometimes say, well, how are you going to afford that? And, and, and I, if God's put it in my heart, you know what? It's, I, I, just, I just go. I just do it. If you say, how, how are you going to, how are you going to afford? You know, how do you, how are we going to afford to put on this dinner? Well, let's just do it. Let's just do it. And you know what? God provides potatoes. Wonderful potatoes. I saw potatoes walking in today. I did. Bags of potatoes. Bags of carrots. Bags of, what else? Turkey stuffing. We have more turkey stuffing than we've ever had. We have a mountain of stuffing. <laughs> God provided it, but how does he do it? He does it through people. He does it through people. I, you know, the, the community center, well, how are you going to afford it? You know, how are you going to afford it? You know, you're going to have to turn on the heat. Yes, we are. How are you going to afford it? We just do. Had a fellow go through the community center and he said, you know, every time that door opens, zh, zh, and somebody comes through. We have one of those doors that go, zh, 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 you know, like Walmart. Zh, zh, zh. 
You know, every time somebody goes through, that costs you money. I'm like, really? I'm going to worry about that? you got to be kidding me. You know, we, we want to bring a, a, an extra staff, another staff member on, because we want to enlarge and expand our ministry, because we want to enlarge and expand our church. But how are you going to do that? How are you going to afford that? God will do it. God will do it. Because he's a giving God, and because his people, there are people that worship him that have understood that blessings flow when we step out with a generous, cheerful heart and worship like the wise men. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to just close in prayer. And if you have a need, I'm going to ask if Pastor Brandon and Ruth and, and the other uh, prayer, rest of the prayer team could come. And we're just going to take some time to pray. I'm going to ask Ron if he would hang out just playing some piano just a little softly. And if you'd like to fellowship um, and uh, if you need to go, then you're welcome to go. But Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness that, Lord, you give and you keep on giving and giving. Love gives. God, your love doesn't fail. It keeps giving and giving. And Lord, you called us to be givers that we need to give as well. Now, Lord, there's some people who need a touch from you. They need to receive from you, Lord, this morning a gift of healing, a gift of, of maybe provision, or, or a gift of direction and guidance in, in their lives, Lord. We think of some of our congregation who have had operations this week. We, we think of Anne. We think of um, uh, Dick. We, we think of Don. Lord, uh, that they just need a touch of your healing power in their lives. So, Lord, we give ourselves to you in these times and just minister by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. If you'd like prayer, there's people up here who would be happy to pray with you. We hope you have enjoyed Jesus and Me, and we'll listen in again next week. If you would like to know more about Jesus, you can download our free Bible study, Exploring Christ, from our website, kingswellchurch.com. Just click on the media tab and scroll down to resources. If you would like to make a donation, giving to this ministry can be done on our website using PayPal. Scroll down to the bottom of our homepage and click on the PayPal tab. All donations are tax receivable. May God bless you as you follow Jesus.